This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. This is my right, but someone looking at me, pointing at the same door over here, would say, no, that's on the left. Or if there were a transparent clock in front of me, maybe I say it's ticking counterclockwise, someone on the other side would say, no, it's ticking clockwise. But we don't have an issue with this sense of direction because we can always orient ourselves in a way that we can agree, oh yes, this is on the left. But what if that weren't always possible? Okay, in our everyday lives it is, but what if it weren't? We're gonna revisit the good old Mobius strip, something I've shown in other videos, but I'm gonna do something different in this one. For those who might not know, a Mobius strip is when you take this long flat sheet and put a half twist in it, and then connect the ends. So here we have it, and there's some cool things that happen when you cut this, for example, which I've shown before. But here, I'm gonna take a capital R and move it once around this loop. Now, do not think of this R as something that's on the paper. You need to think of it as a creature or an object that's living in the paper. It's completely flat, and it's again, part of the Mobius strip. As if I wrote a capital R on here and then the marker bled through and then that thing could move around this. In fact, to help with this, I have another R that I'm just gonna put on the other side. So now it's not two R's, it's just one thing embedded in the paper and cannot leave. Okay, now let's move this around once. And just gotta reorient it and we see the R has completely inverted itself from both perspectives. Now, this may seem really weird, but let me put the R back to how it started. Same with the other side. And I keep saying the other side, but technically the Mobius strip only has one side, by the way, and this is still just one R living in this surface. But anyways, now this is how it started, but if we look at it from this perspective, we see it is inverted when we look at it that way. So when we started here and moved it around once, we just revealed this part of it. Okay, so this isn't too magical to us, but think about what this means in regards to the sense of direction for these flatland creatures living in the Mobius Strip. Imagine two brothers, both shaped like an XY axis, and both are named Cartesian. And I drew one on here so I didn't have to hold it. But okay, so imagine these brothers have lived together their whole lives, all day they can play, they can you know, move around and turn, but they can always orient themselves in a way that they agree which way is you know, positive x and positive y. Now imagine one brother decides to take a walk around their world. What this brother would see is this guy walk away, and then, oh, reappear somehow on the other side, and now, if he decided to orient himself, they would find something weird happens. There's nothing they can do such that they agree on which way is positive x and positive y. One has been completely inverted, so their sense of direction kind of makes no sense. And I won't show this here, but if there were two clock twins and one took a lap, then clockwise and counterclockwise would be inverted for one of them. So talking about direction is weird and virtually makes no sense in a world like a Mobius strip. Left and right completely flip on these surfaces by just taking a lap. So how can we call something right or left or clockwise versus counterclockwise? I mean, just imagine a coordinate system drawn around this loop. You'll find there's no way to consistently define directions such as left or right because it just inverts itself. Surfaces that do this actually have a name and that's a non-orientable surface. Most of the shapes and objects we learn in most of school are orientable, which is why this concept can be weird. If you take the surface of a sphere, for example, this is orientable, because for any creature living on that surface, it can take a walk, reorient itself, come back to a starting location, and for sure, not have its sense of direction completely flipped. The same goes for a torus or a cylinder or whatever, most shapes you're familiar with. So could our universe be non-orientable? Locally, it's not, but I mean, thinking of the entire universe, could it be? Imagine what that would look like. Remember, in this world, the creatures don't know they're experiencing a 3D twist. 
They think they're just taking a walk and things become inverted. So imagine your twin traveling away in some rocket to somehow return from somewhere else and they're just completely inverted. Not only is their left and right switched, but like their organs are on the other side of their body. Birthmarks have been switched over. This person is literally inverted in every way. That isn't possible with just three spatial dimensions. There had to be something like a higher dimensional twist in order to achieve this. But if that could happen, then our universe would be non-orientable. Thus, we could not consistently define things like left versus right or clockwise versus counterclockwise at least on the scale of the entire universe, where amazingly these inversions would hypothetically be possible. I've made the comparison before where on a truly flat surface, a flatland creature has no way to invert itself because it's embedded in the surface. It requires either a higher dimensional twist or a higher dimensional being, myself, to move it through that higher dimension, apply the rotation in that dimension, and place it back in its world, completely inverted. And similarly, we cannot completely invert ourselves just like the Flatlanders, because we have to somehow have access to a higher spatial dimension, which we do not. Now, one example of a higher dimensional object, a well-known one, that is also non-orientable, is a Klein bottle. This is what you get when you join two Mobius strips together in a universe with four spatial dimensions. We can't do it in three dimensions because there will be self-intersection, which is what you see right here. This point is where the fourth dimension is required because an actual Klein bottle does not have self-intersection, which we can't accomplish here. But yes, this is non-orientable. I can't really demo it, but if we did move an object along the surface, you could come back to your starting location completely inverted. Now, something important to realize here with a Klein bottle, an actual Klein bottle. These are two-dimensional manifolds embedded in four dimensions. Like this paper is, let's say, two-dimensional, but I can bend it through that third dimension. Now, does this make it three-dimensional? Because it still theoretically has no height here, so it can be a little weird how we classify it. So instead we say it's a 2D manifold, it's two-dimensional, but embedded in 3D space. And this is a 2D manifold as well. As in locally, if you zoomed in on a real Klein bottle, it would look 2D and flat, just like the surface of the Earth. Now the surface of the Earth is also a 2D manifold, just the surface, kind of like the skin of the sphere, which is 2D close up. But it's embedded in 3D space, while the Klein bottle is embedded in 4. So it wouldn't make sense to say something like, oh, maybe our universe is one big Klein bottle and thus non-orientable. Because our universe, according to general relativity, is a four-dimensional manifold, one of which is time, the other three being space. Okay, now knowing that, when these flatland creatures moved around the Mobius strip, and the Mobius strip, by the way, is a 2D manifold embedded in 3D space, because you can't have a Mobius loop on a completely flat surface, would these creatures feel anything? Because they are 2D, but they're being, you know, bent to the surface in, in a third dimension as they move around it. Not much, but slightly. Or take this up a notch. If our universe did have a four-dimensional twist somewhere, would we feel it? I mean, it's warping our body in a higher dimension that we don't ourselves have access to. So what would happen? Well, in the book Hyperspace, which I definitely recommend if you like this kind of stuff, the author talks about a really smart guy named Bernard Riemann, who had a similar thought. Riemann imagined some small creature living in the universe of a crumpled sheet of paper. Now, since this paper is distorted, then so would the creature itself. It, in theory, bend with the universe like we saw with the Mobius strip. So what would this creature living in this world experience? Well, Riemann imagined that they'd experience some strange, unseen force as they try to navigate the distortions, the various peaks and valleys, and they'd feel these little pushes and pulls, even though they would still think their universe is flat and they're moving in a straight line. So there was a breakthrough thought that force was really a result of geometry and distortion. This then led to some theories that different forces we experience, like gravity, are due to our 3D spatial universe actually being crumpled in a fourth dimension. 
and the strange, quote, force of gravity is due to us being embedded in those distortions that we cannot physically see. Now, this exact theory was never proven or widely accepted, but decades later, general relativity was discovered, which involves some similar ideas. The idea that space-time, our four-dimensional universe, is curved, so there is distortion. But the thing is, with general relativity, that curvature does not happen in a higher dimension. This is weird. I mean, if you're going to curve something two-dimensional, you need that third dimension to curve it through, right? So if our universe is curved, wouldn't we need a higher dimension for it to curve into, like a fourth spatial one? The answer is no. Because the average person, when they think of curvature, they think of extrinsic curvature, where you need a higher dimension to curve into. But in the case of general relativity, this curvature is intrinsic. It's a property of our universe that does not depend on any embedding. For a one-dimensional line segment, there can only be extrinsic curvature. Here it's not curved, but now it is, extrinsically. But with surfaces, there can be both. In fact, Gaussian curvature is an example of intrinsic curvature. I've shown this before, but real quick. If you want to find the Gaussian curvature at some point on a given surface, pick a point, and you have to find a little line segment that goes through that point that curves the most and the least. You have to find both and then multiply their values together. If it curves outwards, it's positive, inwards, negative, and flat is zero. So for a piece of paper, this is pretty boring because any line segment I draw will not curve at all. So you have like zero times zero, so you have zero Gaussian curvature throughout the entire surface as expected. But if I smoothly deform the paper somehow, just like this, and now I pick a point up here, well, the little line segment that curves the most through that point would be the one going here, around this little section. And that has positive curvature. It's not much, but it's curving outwards a little bit. So we have positive there. But the one with the least curvature is the one going down the paper like this. And that actually isn't curving at all. So we have zero curvature times positive, leaving us with zero Gaussian curvature overall at that spot. It didn't change by deforming the paper. So when the paper was flat, it had zero Gaussian curvature, which makes sense. But by something called the theorem egregium, physically and mathematically, I cannot change that curvature at any point on the surface through these smooth transformations. The zero curvature is intrinsic to the paper and does not depend on any deformations or extrinsic curvature in higher dimensions. It's just a property of the surface. And also, extrinsic curvature can only be detected by looking at the surface from the outside. However, intrinsic curvature can be detected by creatures living in that surface. So again, our universe has three spatial dimensions and one dimension of time, as far as we know. And space-time is curved. But now we know there's nowhere extra where that curvature happens. It's all happening here in our universe. It's definitely strange to think about, but this curvature is more about how straight lines are warped by matter and cause trajectories of both light and objects with mass to look different than they would in a truly, quote, flat universe. And this type of warping does not require extra dimensions. No, we haven't even found proof of higher dimensions, so that, along with some of the proven asymmetries of our universe, have led to, as stated in this article, the wide-held belief that space-time must be both orientable and time-orientable. But most sources gave the impression that a non-orientable space-time could, in theory, exist. The universe is extremely large, and our understanding of it is always evolving. Theories involving higher dimensions like string theory or M-theory, if they were accepted, could maybe allow for a non-orientable space-time. No, we don't have strong evidence of this, but you never know what could eventually replace our current understanding of our universe. A more detailed look into all this is really beyond this video, but if you want to dive deeper into exactly what we saw here, I definitely recommend checking out Curiosity Stream, this video's sponsor. What you're seeing here is one episode from their Horizon series called Parallel Universes, which explores the idea of higher dimensions, what's so special about the 11 dimensions of M-theory, how black holes could lead to parallel universes, and several other mind-blowing topics. They also have some of my favorite documentaries from Stephen Hawking that answer questions of like, can we time travel and why are we here? 
So if you've enjoyed what you've seen here, then you won't be disappointed by their selection. And it's not just physics, as CuriosityStream has thousands of documentaries from engineering and technology, to crime and forensics, to history and more. The service is available on a variety of platforms worldwide, including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and more. Also, the pricing only comes out to $2.99 per month, but if you sign up by clicking the link below and using the promo code ZACKSTAR, you'll get your first month's membership completely free, so no risk in at least giving it a try, and this gives you unlimited access to all these top documentaries and nonfiction titles. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.